tarde a todos vocês que estão nos assistindo. From the Federal Courts Channel on YouTube. So we're starting our International Feasibility in Focus to webinar, Tools for Evaluating Infrastructure Mega Projects. My name is Rodrigo Mota. I was invited to, me, to be the mediator. I've been working with uh, the, in this project since 2012, and, and now I am the assistant to the minister. I'd like to thank our His Excellency Minister Antonio Anastasia and uh, all the uh, expert lecturers today and guests. Uh, so we will have the opening event given by the minister's uh, speech, and I'm anxious to hear what he has to say and hear his, uh, his vast knowledge in, in law and in especially in contracts and bids. After that, we will hear from in by Bruno and Erwin Ramirez on the feasibility and focus, a partnership with OLSFs and GIZ, GIZ. And uh, after we have, we'll have the presentations of three experts on the subject: Al Professor Alexander Budzir, uh, Secretary Professor Sergio Pint uh, Pinheiro Firpo, and Claudio Fritschak, Fritschak uh, at the last. And then we will close the proceedings today with a roundtable and questions and discuss discussion. So I'd like to invite uh, Professor uh, uh, Excellency, he's Minister of Federal Court of Accounts is a bachelor and master's degree in law from the Federal University of Minas Gerais, former professor at the Univer Federal University of Minas Gerais, and currently teaches at uh, FGV IDP Unipac in Minas Gerais. He was vice governor and governor of the state of Minas Gerais and senator for the Republic. He was secretary of state and executive secretary of the Ministry of Labor and Ministry of Justice. So, Your Excellency, with a, it's a pleasure to hear you and uh, you're welcome. So thank you so much for the welcome greeting and uh, welcome everyone who's uh, watching our webinar today and f and following on the YouTube channel. It's an honor to be here for the opening ceremony for this important we international webinar online that d discusses mega projects. So I'd uh, not to just to congratulate you who, who are moderating, mediating the event but I'd also like to thank and welcome our guests, particularly Professor Buz Alexander Bazir, as well as Sergio Firpo, who I see here uh, virtually, uh, as well as Professor Claudio Frischtak, uh, one of our na exponential names in the country. First of all, it's an it's a pleasure to to participate because we are faced with a very delicate subject. It's interesting when we talk about mega mega projects. We don't calculate how hard it is to conduct them and the consequences that they can have. A lot of times positive, but also negative impacts as well. As an example for, of our day day to day activities we have here in the history of Brazil, the Itaipu power plant, hydro power plant. It was a, a huge accomplishment that provides enormous services for the country as a billion, billion uh, a several billion dollar project. On, on the other hand, we can't, we, as an opposing example, we have the Trans-Amazonic Highway didn't didn't uh, lead anywhere to anywhere and so these are examples of how we can talk about these mega projects and their, their potential consequences so first of all i'd like to thank the the federal courts uh, technical staff and our auditors who conceived these, this project and started following up on these magic mega projects and now we are talking about feasibility, the feasibility and focus to bring these discussions to light and started with the GIZ, the cooperation with the GIZ, who I thank for their influence and the Federal University of the State of Minas Gerais, the state where I had the honor to be a professor. Uh, more recently, Olaf Olasefs, who I'd also like to welcome to today's event. And they've had a, a fund, an essential representation as 
that brings and brings every all the auditing institutions together in Brazil and now with the uh, Oxford University as well so that like to welcome Professor Budzir, who enriches the projects and the discussion, because we know the need to pr move forward based on the experiences of those who moved forward before we did. So we need to learn from international experiences that had good and positive results. So I'd also like to thank Kim for his presence and, and like to say that there's a methodology that was produced in the UK a few years ago based on previous experiences that could identify fragilities and challenges that we could face because that with audits that monitor us and always guide our, our us ministers with uh, suggestions and guidance and what we see often in Brazil from there's a, a rush, uh, an anxiety here to, to carry out projects, and there's an aversion to planning, unfortunately. And I'm so, so sorry that this is culturally frequent, but our a lot of our projects are not well, well carried out, especially mega projects, billion, several billion dollar projects. That will that should modify the reality of the the community and the, the area. We're always in such a hurry to carry out these projects. It's it's a human flaw, unfortunately, and I recognize this. But with the but we always had the idea to solve the problem as quickly as possible. But since we have an aversion to planning, and we and we have no love for the the for administrative continuity so the risk of a project being left un, unfinished is even greater than actually being concluded so nowadays we are witness and fortunately after so many years after 37 years the the opening of the railroad that connects north from the south that started during the president sarney's administration and now is concluded after 37 years but there's an it, it was a cost that far surpassed the initial estimate so the due to lack of planning lack of prioritization and it happens due to our lack of uh, love for planning but these methodologies that are already ex ex in existence and especially in developed countries will be incredibly helpful and i believe strongly that it is our role at the federal court of accounts to participate in this process of course we are not the government we don't have the ability to make the decisions that will what will be con conducted and what will won't that's the role of the government and has the knowledge and the power imbued to them and by the popular vote but we can help by monitoring results of these projects and guiding and also showing the flaws and deficiencies so that we're not uh, hand, uh, handcuffed to bids and contracts itself which are essential of course there's the dichotomy of legality and efficiency it's not a contradiction there are actually two principles that need to work together so in this case in addition to the formal issues of a, an enormous contract of this is and and bids and equality and fairness and also the execution of the project the court using its constitutional com competency within our capacity to monitor check and evaluate public policy so we can assess if that mega project that's involving so so much money is it, if it's being carried out at the correct rhythm to deliver the results that it promises to deliver so that is obviously the competency of this the federal court of accounts and our technical staff is get more and more ready to evaluate the external work and we are actually going to launch a, a, a project the practical guide for this methodology based on the british experience and we have it in in portuguese and spanish as well so we will be able to evaluate these so many contracts for these mega projects that we have and which will be explained in more detail in a future presentation. 
I'm not going to go into detail because I have so many experts here. It would be even bold of, of, on my part to talk about this in the presence of so many experts on, in the field. But the deficiency of the lack of in infrastructure that we have is a serious problem for the, the size of the country that we have. But to, we, we are a very ambitious country, and of course the economic international uh, sectors wants to in, want to invest here, but for that they need, first of all, to have legal safety and a favorable environment so that these mega projects can come to Brazil and these, these infrastructure co constructions. And the legal aspects involve several aspects, not just legal, f formally speaking, but it also means that the this predictability that begins when the project is well carried out, well planned. So uh, with risk assessment and the new bid law that we have that will come into uh, fruition and start uh, being enacted by next year, and it emulates and, and rewards planning. So we always had so many problems with with those. So mega projects that are so expensive need detailed planning and infrastructure is dependent on this. So ports and airports, so we can't have a, a robust economy with a huge production if we don't have railroads or highways or silos to store our product or ports to export our product. And our infrastructure is left hanging and left deficient in this case. So we have constructions of all sizes and these represent a, li a, f a huge financial liability of more than 8 billion so it, it, but it goes beyond the money that was wasted is the, exactly the fact that we are visibly and materially the the a picture of a of a failure a, a minimum deficiency that we have in order to carry out a project with beginning middle and end even as a school for for children a daycare for children that are left unfinished and the the steel highway that we had that so we didn't have uh, a lot of these projects concluded and once so we need to discuss the feasibility and it was showed shown when when costs of the refinery in the northeast which was conceived in 2 billion it's already at 20 billion 20 10 times more than the initial estimate. These these are stratospheric amounts, and is it still worth in investing in a project as this? How can these be conceived that where they were estimated at two and now they're at 20? What's the feasibility of this and where are the flaws in this? Where are the mistakes? And that's why this methodology is being launched today. It has this ability based on pre previous experiences. We have, we can assess and see where we made the, the mistakes were made, and try not to repeat the, the, the mistakes of the past. So we need to avoid this unnecessary, uh, these unnecessary mistakes. And of course, it's always very incredibly delicate to, to do this. And I come from a political arena in the executive arena. We always have to be very careful and see the, the where public managers or public authorities come into play to carry out these projects. So that's where an uh, idea comes of the, the the most amount of transparency because taxpayers have the right to know how much they're paying for something. So the more we have objective data and the more this, these data are relayed with transparently but, but educationally to the community, it will avoid uh, embarrassments. But we're, So we're going to carry out a mega project, but it's well consolidated. It was carried out with the best methodology, and it's going to cost 100x, and it's going to create x amount of jobs, and it's going to save x and y above the initial investment. So these consequences need to be listed transparently so the population can follow up and monitor, and it's our role as the court to to check and monitor and inspect to generate information and those because so we can dem democratize the information and allowing p the population to know and so that the, the, the politicians are actually 
applauded for and when they can carry out the project on time and on budget and able to present their results. And I always, I always say that, unfortunately, deficiency of resilience, besides the lack of planning, is also the fact that we do not value the outcomes during decades or centuries. The control agencies, we dedicated only to the rituals, to the procedures, to the form. Well, that's outdated. It's important. We've got to do that as well. But not only that, the outcome is important. How useful that the citizens will use that. So that's the reason why we have to discuss Secretary Secretary Sergio and also uh, the Minister Simone Tebet is observing the expenses. It's not only reducing the cost of building things, but maybe it's wrong. We have to know how much we are spending and if we're spending well and what's the result of that uh, expense so in a broad manner we we having this data i think we have many relevant themes to discuss on this international seminar having the participation of everybody german cooperation giz and also fundamental cooperation of all of is important for us as well is a latin american experience having also the support of the oxford global projects professor alexander it's and having the technical team of the tribunal courts of accounts we are able to no longer having this bad aspect bad effects that are lots of works that are unfinished and also the mega projects that have lots of losses for the brazilian economy so because in its origin it didn't have the concern of not doing or not having any other problems. Well, that's a step, very powerful step that I really would like to be to support. I wish lots of success in today's event. I'd like to thank you very much for this opening session. And I'm sure that the results will measure the possibilities of moving forward in a public management that is more efficient and also with better outcomes, having transparency for the Brazilian society. And hopefully in the future, we are going to have a better infrastructure that shows what Brazil needs. I'd like to thank you very much and wish you lots of happiness and success. Thank you, Minister, for your opening speech. You really has offered a great approach exploring all the problems that we face and also the importance of subjects related to problems in the infrastructure, also quality of cost, expenses, transparency, and also how we share experiences internationally so in this part of partnership, sharing experiences, I'm going to invite Bruno Martinero Lima to talk about feasibility and focus of partnership with all the SEPs and GIZ. Before I'm going to read his CV, he engineer of network engineer graduated from the University of Brazil. He has a postgraduate degree in government auditing from Gamma Filho University, has a position of secretary of inspection of urban infrastructure at the Federal Audit Court, TCU of Brazil from 2016 to 2020. He today has a position of chief auditor of port and railway infrastructure at the TCU. Bruno, you have the floor. I'd like to say to greet everybody. Thank you for your words. It's great to have the minister in our opening session bringing information and also a way to think and ponder about our very challenging context. I'd like to greet all the others that are here today that will share today's presentation and to let you know that us from the tribunal, the, the federal court of accounts, and thank you for Thank you, GIZ, to talk about this challenging subject for Brazil. That's not something new, but in the last years, Brazil 
the minister talks about the experience in the United Kingdom that has been adjusted to Brazilian experience. What we propose in this afternoon is to talk about, to discuss, and can enhance the feasibility of the projects on, on how we make decisions in the public policies in Brazil. Before anything, I talking about the project, I'd like to look into the past and let you know how we came to this moment right now. I'm going to share my screen with you, please. The experience that the Federal Court of Accounts has in the sector of mega projects, I'd like firstly to let you know that last year we have been working for 26 years with fish cobras, is how we oversee the works in Brazil. It started in 1995, National Congress in Brazil, mainly the lower house of Congress had raised the data about the situation of the unfinished works in Brazil. That was the embryo of a unit that was specialized in infrastructure on the part of the Federal Court of Accounts, specialized in overseeing what was happening with the works. That same year, it was requested that the court audited public works and checked if there was any issue so we could send to the Congress all the works that had this kind of problems. And then in 1997, it was formalized this cycle of over the surveillance through the Brazilian laws that is provided every year. So every year we select the works for Brazil so we can evaluate if they are regular, mainly bidding processes, also competition about the preparation of the projects, if they are consistent, the quality, preparation of budget, prices, if they are compatible with the market prices, and also the execution of these works to know to what extent they adhere to the contracts that are signed with companies. So along the years, the tribunal, the federal court of accounts, we had a standardization of its auditing process in 1999. It became much bigger in the political aspect if you compare to the TRT auditing, because at that time it was overpricing in the building of the TRT in Sao Paulo. And so it was something very big. And along this maturity that we have acquired along the years, in 2013, when the TCU units, units they had this expertise, having specializations and an integration amongst the units of surveillance in the work and also uh, the statization process. So we had a much broader view, systemic view about the infrastructure in Brazil in this context, not only how we were surveilling the works, also pricing, regularization, contracts, and also public policy as a whole. Since its beginning, about the selection, priorities of the projects, going through the design of the regulation, and also what the projects, how they would start, and also the federal court is started to evaluate this complete cycle since its early stage public policies investment public investments in the works and also going through the evaluation of these contracts as well the appraisal of the regulation of the sector in this context of specialization the court also we started having systemic auditing to identify the root causes that we face in Brazil, facing mega projects in Brazil. 
sometimes the early appraisals, they had only unit prices, for example, in the execution of the contracts, of the schedule, bidding processes, they were not good enough, despite being necessary. So we could have a, a, a more, I mean, specific appraisal if to make this mega projects take place. Minister Antonio Anastasia has talked about projects that cost 10 times more and has taken years to be consolidated. And many times the root cause, they were not well identified. So we started to d delve deeper into these issues. So last year, we it went through the lack of feasibility of the projects, or sometimes we didn't have the correct appraisal of the feasibility because many times maybe we had this optimism bias or forecast of inconsistent data for the decision-making process and uh, on how we could build and go, uh, go forward in projects that sometimes were not feasible in this context of identifying uh, the root causes and also the lack of analysis. That's when we in the in the court, in the Federal Court of Accounts, together with GIZ, we started thinking about feasibility projects in focus. And in the stages that we face today, in the afternoon, that's one of the main initiatives of this project that are bringing about this explanation, this light, shedding light on the problems that we want to face in Brazil now, so we can really have a, a, a better decision make decision making process without any optimism bias, with a better appraising appraisal about how these mega projects will cost, how much they will demand of efforts, and more than ever to select better these projects and also prioritize the projects in the sphere of infrastructure. I'd like to wish a great webinar to everybody here today and then I give the floor back to you, um, Rodrigo. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you very much for your presentation. You really brought a great landscape about how TCU is working in the area of surveillance, talking this uh, when we talk about feasibility and focus. So right now, I'd like to invite Irvin Ramirez. He's going to talk about feasibility and focus of partnership with OLSEFs and GIZ. And then I'm going to read his uh, resume. He is director of the regional projects, strengthening external environmental control and strengthening external financial controls for the prevention and effective fight against corruption implemented by GIZ and OLSFs, a degree in international trade from the Institute Technological in the Studio Superiores de Monterrey, where he also has postgraduate studies in applied public management also worked as a director in the institutional relations at the Superior Audit Office of the Federation of Mexico and collaborated in the presidency of OLACEFIS from 2015 to 2017. I'd like to thank you very much, Rodrigo. First of all, I'd like to thank the partnership and also to send warm regards for the Minister Antonio Anastasia. Thank you very much for the cooperation, Minister Bruno Dantas, and everybody from the Federal Courts of Accounts, and Rodrigo Bruno Davi, and all the, those that represent the unit that is specialized in auditing both port and rails in Brazil. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the participation of everybody from Federal Court of Accounts, other control agencies that are part of OLSFs. So I will give a presentation. I'd like to share my screen. I'm going to start speaking in Spanish. If you want to listen to the translation, click, click on the button, please. And so I'm going to let you know why the German cooperation is so important. Please, can you see my presentation right now? I can see your presentation already. 
So I'm going to change the language right now. Viabilidade em foco para nós outros na cooperação alemana é uma iniciativa. Evi, eu acho que você vai ter que, que clicar nessa nesse nesse ícone do do globinho aqui que tem de interpretação na parte de baixo do, do da sua tela. I think you're going to have to click on the bottom bar where the, you can click on the interpretation channel and and choose the language here. So de baixo, Sim, veja se você está... Agora sim? Me escuta melhor? É, calma aí. Agora, agora está bem, não, para a interpretação? Hum, ainda não. Deixa eu ver aqui. Eu troquei para o canal de espanhol agora. Ah, é, agora correto tem... agora. Pode falar, então. Perfecto, muchas gracias eh, por la paciencia y por, la, por el espacio también para presentarles. Viabilidad y enfoco. Thank you so much for your patience and, and the opportunity to speak. And the feasibility and focus too, as uh, RCF, as the, the acronym in English, it's a relevant initiative for for uh, German cooperation, not just because it starts with the cooperation. Uh, we've been cooperating since our, our regional strengthening uh, and environmental uh, external control project. It, it also follows up on a regional project that we have with OLSFs as, and has a, could could have a very promising future for the cooperation in the next in the coming years. And that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about in the, the next few minutes. And Minister already mentioned this and was, gave a very relevant and rich discussion of a presentation on the infrastructure, the importance of infrastructure and all the government construction projects in, in the country. And as you can see in the slide, this contributes to the economic growth as well as effectively improving inter public interests, problems that have significant causes that can generate jobs and also have uh, improved the regions where these constructions are carried out. So we see several challenges in this area due to uh, uh, unfinished uh, projects and different examples that we can see in the pictures here. So uh, national, uh, Brazilian, uh, Mexican, and Colombian and Bolivia, Bolivian projects. So the the list is long. So here we can see the role that these entities have, because from from uh, vigilance and and uh, inspection, and we can we can have an export uh, assessment of the the public losses but we can also prevent and this type of methodology this type of approach this innovative uh, approach are the reason for this webinar and the and the mini courses and and the plan to carry out this this project we want to work with these new approaches that have that come from the uk and that are influencing the tcu in brazil and we so we want to work with in this cooperation with olsefs and drive and foster and do the the appropriate uh, adaptations that we need because we need to do new training and create manuals for these these projects and we will discuss this in uh, the next uh, the, the presentations and so why is G the german government participant participating in this so we can say that giz is a, a government agency that implements cooperation technical inter international cooperational and educational as well GIZ's role it focuses on sustainability, and we have three main uh, points here. Social responsibility, ecological balance, and also uh, economic efficiency. They are in important aspects, especially when we talk, also when we talk about uh, public sector infrastructure. In Latin America, we have a strong strengthening project for uh, whether the environment and energy and also the production of renewable energy and bio and the care with biodiversity and governance which is also in is a key aspect of OLSFs and also triangular cooperation and of course we also carry out work in 
in different platforms, not just the public sector, but also, also cooperation with the economic sector for a work that sustains sustainable development. So the work of GIZ works in several fronts, and one of them is strengthening capacity or knowledge and education of the the superior inspecting co courts and institutions but it's so but our work here that uh, that I, as since I that I've already mentioned in other presentations the core are these main principles of intozai I talk of intozai p12 that has this this external control for of government projects to improve the life of citizens. So with the German cooperation from GIZ, I can give examples like uh, corruption prevention, uh, integrity, working for improving uh, infrastructure and uh, environmental resilience. So we do a, a work a, alongside OLSFs and OL and other entities that cooperate like AfroSci and Intosci, uh, among others, and bilaterally and globally. So we want to strengthen the action of the FSs and also work throughout Latin America with all the technical institutions carrying out a work that's is essential. And we, for example, we have an infrastructure project, the a Committee for Education, uh, also he spearheaded by T TCU, and that is, and working on all um, important first, that are all important for sustainable development. So uh, within a cooperation that in impacts and optimizes pol public policy and also working with the managing knowledge with good practices for of impacts within this methodology this methodology that contributes to this exchange of b uh, good practice or best practices that can be adopted and implemented in different contexts nationally and internationally allowing for a more cohesive work with this uh, network called OLSFs. And of course, we also have uh, audits and uh, accounting and the impact of these audits that they so that have a more preventative work and that they impact in infrastructure positively so that uh, the population can see the, the projects C uh, concluded and we can see the economic impact but that they don't create and generate uh, uh, environmental impact and that they promote uh, a healthy development and that they can actually help the vulnerable and for these groups that are have been impacted so negatively with uh, due to corruption or or construction that was poorly carried out so that they can receive these benefits because there are several impacts and not just environmental and social as, uh, but it's social as well so all this while improving the public tr trust the public's trust in the government and so I'd like to talk about our regional, all our regional project, and we've been cooperating for over 10 years, and we have have a work carried out work that, with the help of all the LSFs, and we have the environmental agencies already with our eye on 2030 goals, and so also corruption prevention, and we have uh, positive initiatives, and we'd like to move forward as we're showing in this slide. And I'd like to give you some, some dates and deadlines for the project that will approach this education, uh, inspection, monitoring, and digitalization, digitization of these external controls of the government while looking to foster a better environment and better uh, government action. So, so throughout the week, and I'd like to invite all of you to see and read the magazines on the the estimates of the impact estimates, and we so we have 
three, and you can see here how we've been carrying out this work, the first stage of the feasibility and focus as well. So I'd like to conclude with this slide on the prevention, corruption prevention, which is in incredibly important to us in GIZ and the German cooperation. And as I mentioned before, th this public infrastructure along with the public infrastructure are the sectors that have the greatest risk for corruption. And of course, this is incredibly relevant to us because the effects, the adverse effects of this are not just social, but economic and environmental. So working with these superior inspection institutions, we can see an improvement of the a visibility not just to identify and uh, apply fines or ask for uh, to the, our money back but to, it goes beyond that so we want to carry out interventions with our colleagues and the minister uh, know this so we want to strengthen and reiterate our co co cooperation with Olosevs and, and thank everyone from from our staff and Katri Katrina and uh, so for the the follow up and the continuous work that we've been carrying carrying out and i could they will be able to explain more of the work that we've been carrying out and we have this infrastructure here and so i'd like to thank you so much and thank you everyone everyone who will be presenting and uh, and uh, a special thanks to professor alexander you had such a rich presentation. Thank you so much for your words and brought, uh, brought us uh, a broad overview of, uh, and we'd like to thank you from Olosefs and TCU already for, and the partnership with the GIZ. It has been incredibly rich on the subjects uh, and sharing experiences between the courts and um, auditing agencies and all of steps to develop capacities and improve external controls as well along with uh, pu uh, public management so f moving on now let's we're, we're going to begin our presentations of our uh, specialists and I'd like to invite uh, Professor Budzir to talk about the topic of what you should know of uh, cost overrun and uh, optimism bias. He is a professor of the side business school at, in Oxford, and he has a, he's a PhD from the same institution. He is currently CEO and co-founder of Oxford Global Projects which brings together the world's leading project management experts and leading researchers in the field. His research focuses on project management covering areas such as infrastructure, energy and information technology at, Ox at Oxford. He teaches project and program management, risk management and systems thinking. His works were highlighted in Harvard Business Review, Financial Times. He has experience as a consultant and advisor in the public and private sector to improve the delivery of strategic uh, important uh, projects. So, Professor Alexander Bazir, so we're so happy to have you here and uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much and it's, uh, it's a great honor to be here and uh, as uh, uh, I will. Oh. <laughs> Everybody just jumped screens. One sec. Uh, there we are. Um, <clears throat> and I would like to share some of the insights that we have collected over the years and also explain a little bit sort of why we are seeing or what we are having why we're having the system in the uk that you heard so much about and i want to sort of explain a little bit of this and why that system uh, came about and what that reaction was and pretty much kind of what the big philosophy uh, uh, underlying that system is and as you can uh, see already in the title of my presentation, it is all about cost overruns and what we need to know and what I would like you to understand about cost overruns, because cost overruns are a real problem. You've seen just, uh, I wasn't saying beautiful picture, horrible pictures of half finished projects, the amount of wastage that is going on, not only in ecological terms, but also in economic terms. And at the same time, we all know that this problem is not a particular new problem. Uh, if you have ever been to uh, the city of New York, and uh, I was there just uh, about a year ago, and I was using this wonderful little piece of infrastructure. 
and uh, it's tucked away between the buildings and it's the Holland Tunnel. And when I drove through there, or I was sitting in the back of a taxi to drive through there, I was thinking, why is it named the Holland Tunnel? It doesn't even point towards the Netherlands or anything like that. And then I discovered a little plaque. I was in a traffic jam. So there was a little plaque at the tunnel entrance. And it was explaining that the tunnel was named after the lead engineer. <clears throat> who built the tunnel. And back when the tunnel opened, it was the eighth wonder of the world. Everybody celebrated this tunnel. It was the largest vehicle tunnel in the world back then. So that was in the 1920s. And this project was beset by projects that you think, oh, it's probably typical for a project in transport infrastructure, particularly a tunnel back then the longest. It had about 69% cost overrun and took a little more than twice as long as the project uh, as planned initially. And the interesting thing, while why, despite these setbacks, the head of engineering, the chief engineer, who devised this tunnel got the plaque was because for him the experience was so stressful that halfway through the project when it was about 60 percent complete he died of a heart attack so there's an engineer who gave his life to the project and i think that's something really horrible and sort of there is not just these abstract consequences on money there's not just these abstract consequences on sort of the economic sustainability sometimes of uh, big companies involved big construction companies involved i also think about this very personal cost of that is happening to the people involved now that was in the 1920s <clears throat> and as you just heard from rodrigo I've been looking at this systematically now for the last 14 years, and we have collected data on more than 17,000 projects globally. And what you see here is an overview of our data on, uh, it is in the first row, you see what is the average cost overrun for a project of a certain type. And they're all uh, sorted from the best to the worst cost overruns. And you see in the second row, what is the frequency by which cost overruns have happened and the third row is the average delay and then uh, the next one is the average benefits overruns and here a negative sign means that there were fewer benefits economic benefits than anticipated or planned for after the completion of the project and the final row down there the cost black swans that is the frequency by which projects turn into massive disaster where they double their cost and more and if you look around and see sort of we see some projects like solar power perform really really well and then on the right hand side we already in the introduction heard about uh, big hydroelectric dams and how challenging they are there's also staging the olympic games and i know uh, brazil had recent experience with that and sort of one of the most risky categories that we can see at the moment in the world is for instance finding solutions to store old nuclear waste so there is when we are planning projects this immense variability of projects and even if we're just looking at a thing like rail right you see here there is uh, on average about a 30 percent overrun on cost there's about a 30 percent overrun on schedule and on average there's about a 20 percent shortfall in the economic benefits and the revenues generated by fewer passengers showing up and you might think you know these are kind of numbers that you would think we can all tolerate but when we're actually taking these numbers together and asking together this kind of question, if we're just looking at construction projects, we're taking all construction projects that we've data on, so a little bit more than 7,000 projects, again, globally, and then we're asking the question, okay, how many of these projects stayed on budget? Okay, that's about 40%. Two out of five projects stayed on budget. And then we're asking the next question, how many of these projects did not only stay on budget, but also delivered on time or earlier. And that is about 5% of projects, so one in 20. And then you ask the question, okay, how many of those did not only deliver on budget and on time, but also the benefits they promised they would deliver 
or exceed those benefits, then it is 0.2%. So two in a thousand projects, one in 500 projects. Now, that is what my colleague Ben Flubier here at Oxford a long time ago has called the iron law of major and mega projects, that they are over time, over budget, over and over again. Now, this has been an issue. Seeing this has been an issue in the 1920s, when we're thinking about water infrastructure, we have actually quite good data of what happened, for instance, in the UK when the big canal system was built in the 1830s and 1840s, where the average cost overrun of the canals was 154%. They were all they all went bankrupt. They were all private infrastructure back then. So this is an issue that we've been aware of for a very long time. And there's a lot of things we can do. And we already talked about capability strengthening and really understanding the root causes of these things. But when we started our research and sort of uh, working also together with the UK government, one question we found was uh, that this is the iron law. What if we take a different perspective of this? What if we don't think of the budget as uh, we don't think of the iron law as projects being over budget and over uh, time and under benefits over and over again? What if we think about this problem differently? What if we think that projects underestimate their budget, they underestimate their time, and they overestimate the, the time uh, their benefits over and over again? And that was the first line of thinking, right? Uh, having a good estimate, a good feasibility study, good preparation of the project, it doesn't guarantee success. But having a bad estimate and bad preparation of the project, that does guarantee failure. That is sort of the short thinking behind this. Now, when we're looking at research, why is this happening? And what's the basis of coming up with policy decisions and different policies to look at this kind of problem differently? Why is this happening? Well, there's a lot of different explanation out there that researchers have studied for the last uh, more than 20 years, mostly in transport infrastructure, and then later on in energy, and now across all these different sectors that I showed you data on earlier. And there's a couple of explanations that are sort of technical. We're just not very good at forecasting. And then there are economic and political and psychological explanations that have to do with non-rational or biased decision making. So let me explain a little bit what the big three categories are. The first idea is that we're just not very good at making forecasts. And everybody always says, you know, the public sector, every government should have so much data. But when you actually start talking to them, you realize very quickly how little good data governments actually hold. So the natural idea is that we just need to have more data and we need to build better models about the projects we are going to start. And that will improve the forecast. And the logic is not bad because it has worked for the weather forecasting services. And here you see the snapshot of the control room of uh, the agency that is flying Meteosat, the Meteosat network. These days, thanks to satellite technology, we can identify the starting conditions that we need for complex weather forecasting models down to the resolution of a square kilometer across the globe. And we can take that data in real time and then put it into our forecasting systems. And then your little app on your phone can tell you pretty accurately uh, with 90% accuracy what the weather is going to be sort of in the next two to three days, 80% accuracy five days out, and a little more than 50% accuracy for the next 10 days. And we have achieved that by investing in better models and lots of research about these models and in better data to feed into these models. And that is one explanation. But when we are looking at the data that we see in the world of mega projects, then one of the things stands out, because if this is truly a, an estimation error, we just don't have good enough models. What we should see is that our models are sometimes right and sometimes wrong. So if you're making a lot of forecasts with these models, the errors should, they are there, but 
with thousands and thousands of forecasts, these errors should average out. On average, they should be zero. We should be with the same likelihood over predicting the temperature the next day and under predicting the temperature the next day. Or in our world, right, in some forecasts, we are estimating too much cost. In other forecasts, we're estimating too little cost. And if we taking like a large number of these forecasts, we should see that the error is zero. And then we can talk about how to bring the ranges down, but it works out kind of thing in a large number. But when we're looking here at the bottom on the data on transport infrastructure, this is uh, one and a half thousand forecasts that we're looking at here. What we're seeing is that no, these forecasts don't make errors in a way that if you're looking at more than a thousand forecasts that they cancel each other out. So there is an average cost overrun of 28%. It's not zero. There is an average delay of 37% across all transport infrastructure projects. And it's not zero. There is an average traffic shortfall on these projects of minus 6%. It's not zero. And the standard deviations are huge. And what that shows us is that actually the data are not just error, full of error and randomness, these data actually have a bias. They have a bias towards cost overrun, or as we now know and should look at it, a bias towards underestimation of cost, underestimation of schedule, and overestimation of benefits. And that is quite reliable, quite systematic bias. So what does it leave us with? It leaves us with the explanation of bias. And here's one illustration of a bias. It's an optical illusion. And uh, optical illusions are a bias because the way our brains process visual signals. And I took this, um, apologies to who you, who's seen this before, I took this from Dan O'Reilly's brilliant book on predictably irrational, which looks at consumer choices. We're making these biased decisions, not only when it comes to big projects, but we make them every single day. And an optical illusion is a great example. You see here this checkerboard, there's two squares, one is marked A and one is marked B, and I'm sure that we can all sort of agree that the square with the letter A on it is a little bit darker than the square with the letter B on it, which seems to be light grayish, white-ish in the shadow there of that cylinder. But when I put a mask over this, we see is that they are actually the same color. Now, it's an optical illusion, you might would have expected that, and you can see us in that. Uh, the other fascinating thing about optical illusion, even though I told you it's an optical illusion, I've showed you it's an optical illusion. Look, they are the same color. They are the same color. But as soon as I put the whole figure back in, our brain can connect, cannot correct that bias. They pop back to being the same color. We could play this all afternoon, and uh, there would be no way for your brain to actually truly see these two squares for their real color they are. They always pop back to these two colors. And that's a big problem with the psychological biases. And when it comes to decision making, we have a lot of these biases. You already heard people refer to, the previous speakers refer to optimism bias, the thinking that the future will always be better that in our projects, we will be so much more productive. We will have fewer risks. Everything will be better about the future. We will be cheaper. We will be faster. Uh, we have less inflation and be not impacted by those kind of uh, events on the project. And that is an optimism that in projects, quite rightfully, people always call out because uh, in projects, we're doubly optimistic. We're optimistic about the good things like productivity, the speed of delivery, the delivery conditions. And we're optimistic about the negative risks, the uncertainties we're looking into, the size of inflation, uh, the impact and likelihood of risk events happening on the project. So we're doubly optimistic. That actually ends up to quite a big drag on the performance of the project. Now, the this is not just related to projects, and there has been a lot of research since the 1960s, now for more than 60 years, into what happens in executive decision making. And there's lots and lots of different biases. There's also a self-interest or political biases if uh, uh, somebody wins from doing a project, and therefore we have an incentive to get the project going, 
and start the project because we will gain from it. So there's uh, things like the self-interest bias. There's people have fallen in love with the project. Who doesn't do a great project that does a great thing, something really transformative to a community? Who doesn't want to do good to the citizens that will benefit from a project like that? There's also an element of groupthink that a lot of experts get in the room and we too quickly look at a single alternative without challenging whether better, or cheaper, other alternatives, less risky alternatives are available. There's a question about saliency. We only remember recent projects, typically successes. Um, there's a problem with availability of data. We can't remember data very well, so it's very hard to bring data into this decision-making. We also might anchor ourselves too early on very early estimates. And I've seen countless projects that had early estimates that were half the size of later estimates. And instead of just accepting that, that is now after a serious look at the project, the costs have gone up. They have to explain endlessly why the costs have gone up. And not just that there's more knowledge about the project, but it's almost seen as something bad that has happened. Uh, and therefore, we have a big drag to never change the numbers we initially estimated. Or there's a halo effect. We simply believe that he is a brilliant project leader or he is a brilliant company who's really good at executing projects, that they will fix all our issues because they have done that in the past. And often the sunk cost fallacy where we throw good money after bad money. And then you get the optimism that we already talked about. You get also that negative side of things that nobody really wants to think about how bad things can be. Are we neglecting those black swans and the impact of very negative events? And we generally are averse to losses. So we do not like to think about failing. We always like to frame things in terms of succeeding. And that actually means we're taking much riskier bets. So this has been a problem. And these are just a couple of biases, and I've taken those from an HBR article by Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for his research over the last 60 years on how decision makers, senior executives in private sector, in public sector, fall into these decision traps and make not so optimal decisions uh, when they are asked to make important decisions like whether we should invest in a project or not. And in order to counteract these biases, in the UK in 2004, very specifically, the Treasury, so the Ministry of Finance here in the UK, introduced a very simple methodology. This methodology was originally devised in the 1970s by Daniel Kahneman, uh, who was asked to apply his research insights on these psychological mistakes and decision making to projects in America and the US. Uh, in the defense space, uh, research and development projects. And he came up with this idea and it was really built out and made policy by the UK government. And the idea is relatively simple and is the idea of whenever we make an expert judgment or a judgment goes into a human judgment is, is biases of a decision-making process, we should just stand back for a second and check and try to find and use data to fact check that judgment, whether it was right or whether it was a little bit off, whether it was too optimistic or was ignoring the sunk cost or fell into any of those decision-making traps I just showed you. And the idea is relatively simple. It's a three-step process. First, you're looking uh, for data. You're looking at where has this been done in the past? Here in Brazil, internationally, what can we learn from others? So we want to build a road. What are the typical risks involved in building a road? So first we need to identify what is our peer group, our reference class of past similar projects that we can find data on. And then in the second step, we are looking at uh, what the data are telling us. What do the data tell us about the ranges that we should be seeing for key elements of the estimate? That can be cost, that can be schedule, that can be benefits, that can be productivity, that can be all sorts of variables that are important for the planning process. And then in the third step, we are applying that to the decision at hand. Now, to give you an example, I've not selected here a UK example, but I've picked an example from the other side of the world. And this is an example of building a high-speed train. This is in Hong Kong, and it's the express rail link that connects uh, Hong Kong to the mainland network in China. And this project 
Here you see the big terminal station in the middle of Hong Kong, the world's largest high-speed rail station in the world at the moment, and uh, so broken engineering record. And here the question was, uh, the project got into trouble and because they didn't make good decision up front of what is the risk of a cost overrun. So we are fairly certain about, uh, we have developed a good baseline for the cost. We now want to know what type of contingency, how much contingency do we need to put on top of these projects? Now, in that analysis, the first step is to then say, what is this project similar to? A broad selection of project that you can find data on. And that is high-speed trains, that is tunnels along uh, all of the alignment of this high-speed rail network is in a tunnel. It's a tunnel that runs from Hong Kong all the way to the mainland. And it is also similar to metro projects, you could argue, because it is built in the middle of a city, the railway station. So a big, densely populated area with challenging logistics and impacts, environmental impacts on its neighbors that we need to take in account of. And then once you have this, we are creating in the second step what has happened to these projects in the past. And here you see on the uh, on the horizontal axis, we see um, sort of uh, the frequency of how often we have observed, in this case, a certain cost overrun to assess the cost risk of these projects. And you see here that half the project, so 50% of the project, had about a cost overrun of 30% or more. And the other half of the projects had a cost overrun of uh, less than 30%. Or if you look sort of more on the left hand side here, if we see some what happened to the worst 10% of projects, then you can read here off the curve if you chart it like that, it's probably about there, that these projects, uh, the worst 10% of the projects had a cost overrun of more than 100 and 15% and 90%, uh, the other 90% of the projects had a cost overrun was less than that. That is what simply the historic data tell us, simply charting out what happened to others. And then in the third step, we can make a decision about this. So in the third step, we can ask two important questions. The first important question is not just what is history telling us about how often this has happened. No, let's switch this around and talk about the risk appetite. So as decision makers, as the general public, what is our risk appetite for seeing a further cost overrun in this project? And then on the other hand, on the other axis, that then tells us what should be our uplift, our contingency on top of the base estimate. So for instance, if we had a risk appetite of 20%, that in 20% of the cases, this project comes back and asks for more money, then that would give us about 65% cost uplift that we should plan for. Or if we're more aggressive or we have less money, you can clearly see is there some questions about affordability as well. Uh, if you had a 50% risk appetite, then we're here at the 30% <clears throat> required contingency that we talked before. So applying that to the project, um, there is a series of questions. The first question is, is this project any different from past previous projects? Have they planned any worse or better than other projects? No, that's a good solid answer. And that means that actually thinking about what happened to others is a good first assumption of what might happen to this project. So then the 50%, uh, the 50%, what happened to 50% in the uh, projects in the reference class, that is a 30% uplift. So Back then, this was planned at 65 billion Hong Kong dollars. Um, and uh, so that is about, um, well, it is it is roughly divided by eight. So it's about 8 billion US dollars. Um, so applying a 30% uplift to that, the budget is 84.5. Um, then of course, in this case, um, some of the stakeholders were more risk averse. They wanted an 80% certain estimate, so they only had a 20% risk appetite, but that would put the budget at 100, nearly $110 billion. You can clearly see how expensive it is to get more certainty. And big negotiations happened afterwards about what is the level of risk we can tolerate for a further cost overrun versus what kind of targets do we want to set the project and what can we afford? So there's a 
more complex negotiation between the stakeholders. And in the end, this project set a budget around that 50% risk appetite mark. So, and the project finished ever so slightly, only 200 million Hong Kong dollars above that estimate. So delivered pretty much on budget schedule that was easier to negotiate. That was taken only at a 20% risk appetite. Nobody was had an appetite for announcing and yet another delay of the project. So that was set at a much higher level. And the project finally opened ahead of schedule, four months ahead of schedule, it opened in September 2018. Um, so before the opening date at the 31st of December of 2018, that was publicly communicated. So they beat their own schedule. And this is what we find when this project, when this kind of methodology is applied to big projects. You see it here on one project in the UK. Uh, this has been made government policy in 2004 and has since then been applied to all major projects. And a recent research, uh, independent research from Georgetown University has found, this is not they did, the researchers went in and looked at the average overspend in the UK portfolio in major transport projects before the policy was enacted in 2004. For the preceding projects, they had an average overspend of about 45%. And after this policy was introduced that you need to go back and compare yourself against the data and then compare these estimates against each other and correct for potentials of optimism and all sorts of psychological bias in this forecast. Since that policy got introduced, these average overruns in transport infrastructure project that reduced from the 45% it was before to only 5% since the policy has been introduced. And that is the UK experience. And others have followed suit. Now we're talking about this in Brazil. Uh, recently, Ireland, um, the Republic of Ireland in the, in, the, uh, in the European Union has adopted this after a series of scandals on some building projects and overspends and um, all sorts of disasters that particularly happened in hospital construction in Ireland. And we also seen here, as you can see here, for instance, the government in Hong Kong has been uh, using this methodology now for a series of years to get a better handle at understanding their project and uh, improving that kind of ability to forecast these projects. So just as a summary, what I really would like you to think about and to do, of course, since we're launching this project and the reports about this today, really, uh, I want Brazil to overcome that iron law of major projects. This can be done. And it is really important that we're not only thinking about how we can better deliver the projects, but also equally that we're thinking about that risk of underestimation and that we are starting to check projects, not only for the technical qualities and the economic impact, but also for this biases in decision making. And that we then use methods, data-driven methods like reference class forecasting to actively debias our projects and improve the project performance and the delivery of these projects. Because if I can just say one last word on this is that, you know, a good entry decision, a good accurate forecast doesn't guarantee success, but a bad forecast and a bad investment decision always guarantees failure. And that is what we want to overcome. Muito obrigado, Alex, professor Alexander. Thank you Thank you very much, Professor Alexander. It's really a great overview on how the mind of people works in the planning, decision making processes as well regarding this optimism bias. It's very important to consider and embody to take this bias out when we appraise projects in the feasibility studies. It's very important that we learn about these methods. Also, this, to think about the RCFs together with OLSFs and GIZ to uh, have sustainable projects to conduct studies for practical application in the road rail works in Brazil, applying this method of 
RCF and how to apply that in practice. It was already concluded and very soon it's going to be made available in English and Portuguese and also in Spanish for all those that want to learn about that. I'd like to thank you very much for your participation. And if you have time, I'd like to ask you two questions. I'm going to invite Professor Sergio Pinheiro Firpo. He's going to talk about monitoring, evaluating public infrastructure policy Analysis. I'm going to read his resume. He's a professor of the Institute Unibanco Chair at INSPIR, grad, undergraduate degree in economics from the University Camp, master degree in economics from Pukirio, PH and a PH, assistant professor in the University of British Columbia, also professor in the University of Pukirio, associate professor at EESP, FGB, FGV, and the Secretary of Monitoring and Evaluating of Public Policy Economic Affairs at the Ministry of Planning and Budget of Brazil. So, Professor Secretary Sergio, I'd like to thank your participation. Please, you can open your mic. Have a good presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going, can you see me? Can, I'm going to share my screen with you right now. Okay. Thank you. My presentation is an overview in very short presentation about evaluating public policies and economic affairs and what our secretariat, the role that we are playing in this appraisal process. And how this evaluation process has evolved along the years in the federal government. We have uh, this map for the evaluation of the projects, but there was a, a previous version on how we were measuring public policies in the federal government. Several manners that we have applied First of all, we had a, a working group. We had, for example, JTAG that was evaluating the cost. After that, we created other committees that conducted and still conducts this uh, evaluation of the cost, also subsidies. They are part of this committee of this board and then we had a law an amendment that forms the cmap that is formed by five minister planning revenue services and other ministers we have here these two ministers that were we also created the secretariat for monitoring and evaluation of public policies and also in the planning ministry. The secretariat was created. There was also already a department in the Ministry of Economy that was in charge of finding manners to guide, coordinate all the, the policies, all the programs that should be evaluated and also technical body that was working in the formation of budgetary policies. And now the secretariat has this role of executive secretariat. So there is law, a bill that will evaluate the policies, also proposals that how we define the policies besides the budgetary criteria that we have to revisit all the policies 
that were evaluated along the years. It has this quality uh, evaluation. The main, the main objective of this secretariat is to strengthen the culture of monitoring and evaluation of the policies so we can understand the quality of public costs or public expenses. So here it's important that we look on how the public resources are used by the federal government. Because of that, it's necessary that the systematic appraisals are conducted. First of all, we should have alternatives in the existing policies to improve these uh, policies that we are able, as soon as we understand how it works, how the policies work, so we can offer solutions for to the policies if they are not as good as they should be. At the same time, the other possibility is that we use the systematic appraisals of policies to reorganize the federal budget. To what extent these evaluations can be a useful instrument so this portfolio of public policies are formed. So in the Secretariat, we have a division. It's a division that is in the blue side. It's very much related to CIMAP process. Here, there is a correlation of the inspections, evaluations, that we use at CIMAP, but also we are in charge of formulating and using these evaluations. We believe that it's very important that these evaluations, they come up from this partnership movement, having those that manage these policies. So after that, we are able to use these evaluations because we are close to the to what is being evaluated, we can understand the demands, the problems, how these uh, policies are being managed. And if we have an evaluation that really, ref, really reflects these actions in this evaluation, they will be a great instrument to redesign the policies if it's necessary. But it's, if, it, if it is completely different from the implementation of the policy, it's useless. At the same time, we also have the other side of the Secretariat that we have evaluations that are much faster, executives, so sometimes we are going to design processes that we can we can understand political initiatives and at the same time have a coordination that understand how we have to design evaluations that focus in effectiveness. For example, projects for infrastructure, the experience that we have, they, beside the effectiveness, they are still in the early stages. We still have to work on that. We have some challenges that we face in our agenda and how, for example, we monitor, how we evaluate. There is a perception on how the evaluation has been perceived internally by the managers. Sometimes the focus is very much related to cost and governance. On the other hand, there is a perception that this evaluation is conducted much more because of the auditing process and much less regarding the effectiveness of the project. Sometimes 
they it should give support to the best possible manner that that this evaluation of the policy should be enhanced should be improved and then also is part of that policy and this secretariat is recognized as a supervisor of these activities of monitoring and evaluation. Actually, we would like to be seen as a department that has lots of things to offer to the other sectorial agencies that are already conducting uh, evaluations, mainly the bigger ones, that have departments that conduct these evaluations, offering technical support, also being a partner for improving the policies and having a highlight in the improvement of the effectiveness of the policies. This is today's agenda. How to implement this agenda? First of all, executive evaluations being much faster using the CMAP as well, using, using this commission, having the support of the ministries that we are establishing relationship or sharing information, evaluations, and having conducting effectiveness evaluations. As these evaluations are produced, it's important that they offer more transparency, also communicating what is being done. So there is accountability for the results and for that policy. This is all very important in this process. As I said before, we are getting closer, working closer and closer to these ministries, and we believe that these evaluations, they are more relevant, so we can, uh, could be better for the managers. And we should think in the design of these policies that allow that the management of these policies after they are designed, so we are able to rescale them up and improve the policies as they are applied. CIMAP already has helped. In 2021, we have the two evaluations of infrastructure within CIMAC. For example, one was the integration project of San Francisco River. And also the other project that we have evaluated was the one about conservation and restoration of infrastructure and road maintenance. The outcomes they they show that it's important to have governance uh, redesign of the policies they encompass many different projects but a set of projects that sometimes are very uh, expensive and complex and how with the design of these evaluations is still we're not able to look into the outcomes effectiveness of the policies so i think as alexander has said before the main concern that we have in his presentation was about the underestimation of the cost and also the cost overrun for the consolidation of the project.
uma vez que esses projetos estejam é, concluídos. Né? Existem né, é, evidências na literatura de que isso é possível. Né? Então, aqui alguns exemplos que a gente né, buscou, são três né, artigos que mostram como que projetos, né, como projetos de eletrificação na África do Sul né, teve um impacto sobre, por exemplo, o emprego né, de mulheres que é, passaram a poder é, empreender é, e aumentou o emprego né, delas em 10 pontos percentuais. É, ao mesmo tempo, um projeto né, na, na região metropolitana de São Paulo, né, de transporte público, também mostrou que, um, é, a, que esse projeto teve impacto sobre redução da informalidade. The, the informality of the, uh, labor, the, the labor force, and so in sanitation, that had an, an impact on the hospitalization of children younger than uh, one year old. So there was uh, several evidences uh, on, of uh, positive impacts where it's quantifiable, where we can quantify the well-being for the population. And these, the utilization of these metrics is something that uh, should be sought out in uh, assessment of the of public policies. So it's a discussion that we uh, believe to be relevant and the, what is the policy? What is the project for in, the infrastructure project? So if we think that during the project, if the project has a deadline, a set deadline, and this will generate a product or a, or a service, so and this greater set of programs and actions, necessary actions, which are articulated when uh, a, forecasting and planning goods and services for the population that incur in uh, in taxes and and, uh, and and concessions of loans and this makes the policy the policy much more complex when we uh, are evaluating the projects so assessing policies has to be more challenging where than when you're just looking at projects, because uh, specific projects. So then when you're looking at sets of projects and, and it makes it more challenging, what's more, even more challenging when you're looking at policies uh, is thinking of, of how evalu a typical evaluation where you evaluate a, a control group and, a, and, and then you can have uh, you can evaluate the results, but with projects, you can also evaluate the implementation and monitor and inspect, and, and you're able to build a, a set a, and and uh, and measure causality. So within these these challenges and uh, putting forward an evaluation of public policy agenda for infrastructure, we believe that the first steps were taken already. And and this is a challenge, definitely challenging. But I believe it's a, a challenge that uh, we believe in Semapi that we uh, can that is worth it and that we can overcome it. So I'd like to thank uh, you for your time and uh, the link to our uh, website at our secretariat. Thank you so much, Secretary Sergio, for your very rich presentation it's definitely interesting for us to better understand the how the secretariat works and, and this mission to monitor and evaluate public policies for infrastructure projects and uh, this greater focus on results and the benefits that they generate of a of a policy or a specific project and goes in line with uh, the method method by professor alexander a little not just in the over, overestimation of costs, but uh, the delays, scheduled delays too, but also in the issue of the benefits, uh, overestimation of benefits. So this optimism bias that we mentioned and the optimism of, of um, benefits. So I'd like to thank 
Secretary Sergio, and moving on, I'd like to give, hand over the, the floor to Claudio Frischtak to talk about uh, to projects that are too big to fail and the resource allocation efficiency and infrastructure mega projects. Mega projects. He is the president of InterB Consult Consulting Business Consulting focused on economic, strategic, and financial advisory services to companies and governments in infrastructure, technology, mining, metals, and commodities. He is also a member of several boards of directors, studied at the University of Wisconsin in the University of Campinas and Stanford University, and held various positions at the World Bank. He has also worked as an economist at the Brazilian Ministry of Health and as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Claudio, first, first tech, uh, uh, you're very welcome, and you have the floor, and you have uh, 20 minutes for your presentation. So first of all, well, before getting into the, my presentation, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to, to talk here by the TCU, and m many of us analysts and ob observers and society as a whole understand the importance of the Federal Court of Accounts and the responsibilities that they hold and the role that they, they take on so many key decisions to improve uh, public policies, but in public expen uh, government costs expenses as well. But I'd like to mention, before getting into the pre presentation, t talking about the poor allocation of resources. In large measure, uh, the poor allocation of resources, not just in our country, but worldwide, when there are problems, they stem from a combination of public policies that are sometimes poorly implemented or developed also, but public spending as well. These are a little somewhat distinct. Obviously, the costs are associated to the policy, but not always. Sometimes we can see well-developed policies, but that don't incur in, in public spending. Sometimes you have uh, in, uh, le legislative initiatives, just as an, as an example in Brazil, the new mapping of uh, basic sanitation, there's a public policy that didn't incur in public spending. Actually, it was the other way around. It actually saves money. So there was a huge impact on the population's well-being. Public policy and public spending generate, on the one hand, uh, economic incentives that can be more more or less distorted, so to speak, and they also surpass the barrier of uh, public public spending. And what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is one type of distortion in uh, pu public allocation of, uh, of resources, for, of course, and uh, a problem of poor resource allocation that has a huge impact on productivity of uh, public resources is a much wider discussion, but in the the question of mega projects is incredibly relevant. So if uh, you could uh, put my presentation and share it on the screen, I'd appreciate it. So it's just a brief reflection on efficiency of uh, resource allocation for infrastructure mega projects. Next slide, please. Just a, a, a statement of fact, where here in Brazil we have a huge, his, a long history of poor uh, resource allocation, especially with uh, f physical and social infrastructure uh, projects. That's a, an unfortunate fact. We're not the only ones. I worked in several countries, around, somewhere around uh, 20 countries when I worked at the World Bank and, and when I left the World Bank. So we're definitely not an exception. And it's a fact in many countries. And it's not uncommon that the costs are justified or magnified by flo uh, failures uh, in planning and uh, poorly developed and executed projects that lead to huge waste. Uh, I'm going to mention a study with a, a report that was that was uh, very well developed and showed the impact uh, in 2019 of the TCU 
the, where there was no less than 14,403 construction that were uh, interrupted, or 37.5% of a total of 38,412 construction projects uh, financed by the federal government, which is uh, an astonishing figure. So 14,000 out of 38,000. My only criticism that I could uh, make to the study but that was that in actuality the problem is, actually, is even worse because the study itself obviously it put, shed light on the most dramatic thing, which was the paralysis of this of all the construction, all the projects. But also, but, but there, but it didn't take an account into the the ones that were incredibly delayed and the co the cost overruns too. So 37.5 percent out of uh, 38,000. There are so many others that are already delayed and are already uh, incurring in, in cost overruns. And we know here that when uh, a project is delayed or is actually interrupted, the, the goal of the, the, the construction, the, the, the main goal is to provide a service to the population. And, this, and when that happens, then you don't provide the service. And by not providing the service, the, imp the expected and impact and the impact, the expected benefit is non-existent. It s ceases to happen. So, next slide, please. We have problems observed in the the TCU study and other studies, not just in small but in, in large uh, projects. So we have a long list, and we conducted a study. I'm not going to post it one one more uh, once again. The the results of the study, but you have a long sequence of large projects that with a, that had cost overruns and extremely uh, time uh, time delays. But what I want, as just as Minister Anastasia mentioned in our North South Railroad, that was just uh, finalized after 37 years. It, it was actually concluded in May of this year, actu actually after almost 40 years under construction. Nobody knows how much it went over budget because there's a problem, we have a problem of transparency here, but two other projects that are ongoing I wanted to mention. So two of the, the, the main railroads, the Greenfield that's finance, funded by the public sector in implementation, and the Trans Northeastern, which is a concession, is not a public construction, but it is, a lot of the funding is public, and the East-West integration, and Fial 1 is a concession at this moment, but it was executed until recently with, uh, with public funding. So we did uh, uh, an approximation calculation to the to the moment, because the situation is actually going to get worse, we had a 63% uh, cost overrun, and we have uh, an implementation, implementation delay between 13 and 15 years. So if we compare numbers presented by Professor Alexander, these are, these are actually worse data, worse results for railroads. So the northeastern, trans-northeastern case, so it should be delivered in 20, 2027 when it was expected in, 20, in 2006. So a delay above 15 years and just one of the, the lines. There are two lines. So Eliseu Martins is one of them in POE and then Porto de PC in, in the state of Serra. It's, it's a concession led by a, a private investor, and it's not a public project. But resources spent in executing the, the project are, however, preponderantly public from funds, from, from several, several public entities. I could actually discuss if it's correct or not, but that's a fact. I'm not making any judgment of value here. I'm just a statement of fact. Next slide, please. 
fato muito simples. That's a very simple board. We have here two big projects. They are the largest one. They are being executed right now. It's a Greenfield project. 2010, we we were, in 2010, we were finishing the first PAC project called PAC-1. The first one started in 2007, the second one 2011, finished in 15. So the starting point was the end of the first PAC. And that's a very conservative account. We, in real numbers or figures, we are talking about an overprice of 63%, delay maybe above this percentage, but anyhow, I added here numbers and figures. It's easier to visualize more than 15 years. That's what is forecast delay, and then more than the FI, Oh, well, it's much more than that. So it's quite complex. So it's important. It's we'll connect uh, a mine in Caetite with a port that is called Port South. The port project is very complex. Actually, we have to create or to to create a, a offshore port in an island that has to be built from scratch. It's, for example, let's assume that I'm going to add a remark, maybe December 2026. It's a very optimistic term. I haven't seen any optimistic optimism right now. I'm just reporting what is in the media, what companies are talking about, about this project. Next slide, please. And what is the main problem here? Professor has made a great presentation, Secretary Sergio as well. I think we are talking about this for a long time. I think the main problem in our country is how the, the issues in the governance, we're very frail. Any project that we have, I believe that the problem has to do with governance. The, the projects are not well directed, guided. So what we understand by governance, we don't think anything different from what people understand as governance. First of all, we should have planning processes in the long and medium run. This is a process that constitutionally we have the ob obligation of having the process. There is a budgetarian cycle that is regulated according to Brazilian law, and it's not a bad one. This budgetarian cycle, I would say, it was inspired in the best practices, but in real life, it is it fails a lot. The problem is that this planning process in the medium and long run, run sorry, is long. It's verticalized, very few filters, and difficulties in information asymmetry, limited participation of the society, market analysis, social organizations. I like to say that, to emphasize that this asymmetry of information was said here before. It is on both sides, meaning that government doesn't have enough information and private sector also doesn't have enough information in a broad, in a broad uh, sense, all of those that I have mentioned before. The fact is that the government has information, 
lots of information, but the private sector doesn't access that. But on the other side, it's the same thing. They, the private sector would like to, sh to share this information with the government, but the mechanism is not in place. The mechanisms, they, I would say, they are very limited, lots of failure, and we have to overcome that so we can improve the quality of our planning. Planning is key for big projects. It's important to have what we call uh, feasibility. That's, a, 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 that's an asset of the public, of the population. And this public asset is not offered in this process because there are too many failures Firstly, because I would say there is information asymmetry. And there is also difficulties in the process. I think it has to do something to do with polyeconomics, bad quality projects. They are inserted in this process for many different reasons. Some are legitimate reasons, but doesn't matter. All these several reasons, there is a great resistance to modus operandi on how the system works to exclude certain projects. Why is that so? Well, we talk about an issue of uh, economic policy. One of the work that I have designed that we call uh, Climate Policy Initiative by the University of Rio, we got some cases from this university. And at the end of the day, what we call bad cop, or either is the Federal Court of Accounts or the guys that work in the environment. There is lots of pressure. Why is that so? Because in the beginning of the project, there are manners of inserting these filters. The planning process needs to have filters and more information. Além disso, você tem um problema enorme na, na... Well, the other problem is in the execution. Because there are what he calls dead times in the execution. Of course, issues with the cost, the investment. Well, you can be the best public manager. But firstly, you face the public managers, they are very bureaucratic and they are under the public law, public right. Basically, you can only do that, something that is allowed by the law. And that's what we call the symmetry in the public law. You can do only what if you abide by the law. Public managers, if they are efficient, they have lots of difficulties to move forward exactly because of all the bureaucracy that is involved in the process. Brazilian state, both in the federal state, sphere, city sphere, sphere as well, they, all of them, they face the problems and the solution is not clear. There is this difficulty in trust because there are many other cases, the society doesn't trust and sometimes this very perverse political economy as well. I think we have to face these points. There is, of course, the problem of what we call capturing. I mean, if it's secret, it's not correct. And also different interests. It's very difficult to have legitimate interests that meter that 
are that the society is in the Congress that is represented by the Congress, for example, just as it is uh, represented in the executive level. It's very difficult to separate what is good and what is bad. And the other problem that we face is this, the difficulty in attracting a, a greater number of competitors. Sometimes there are some legal restrictions. We are a very closed country. That's a fact. The level of protection distorts the decision of public agents, but also the public and private agents. So when we go through a bidding process, after lots of circumstances, you sometimes have a very few number of competitors. Talking about infrastructure, mega projects, for example, that I somehow know about these projects. What we have observed in the sector of infrastructure is a very few number of competitors in the bidding process. I'm talking about concession. For example, private sector to operate the concessions. I'm going to give a, an example. Actually, we have many examples. For example, if you get the uh, the jury of the crown, when you talk about our main uh, road in Brazil, it's the one between Rio and Sao Paulo, that is Dutra. It's we have very few people that want to participate. One entrant and a competitor, because that's the in the universe of uh, utility services in Brazil. In these very key projects, we calculated, we talked about maybe there were only five bidders. At the end of the day, only two, at least we had two. Better of not having anybody in this bidding process. There are lots of barriers for the new entrants, both in the concessions and also in the public works. There are manners that we know. We have offered some suggestions, maybe reducing these barriers and have few, few, fewer bidders in the concession, for example, of roads in Brazil, the barriers are very high currently. Next slide, please. I know I'm running out of time. I apologize for running out of time. We have to modernize our infrastructure. I think it's important. I'm sorry, I all the time talk about the figures, but it's important to understand what is the dimension of these problems. We invest, we will invest in 2023 according to our forecast, both public and private sectors in all these spheres. We're going to invest 1.95% of Brazilian GDP less than 2% of Brazilian GDP. Our accounts show on the capital stock on infrastructure that we work that we had together with the Brazilian Institute that is called IPEA. We would like to invest 2.1, 4.1, 4.2 of our GDP, at least in the next two decades. We, because of that, we have a shortfall, a gap of 200 billion reais per year. So, so part of these resources have to come from the private sector. I'm going to repeat myself what Minister Antonio Anastasia has said before. 
we have to mobilize private resources in scale. We need to offer more legal security, also regulations that also macroeconomic stability that allows for a lower cost of capital, improve the governance and the quality of the execution of public investment, maybe 0.6, 0.7 percentage of the Brazilian GDP. That's, I'm talking about federal, state and city-wise. So with the correct priorities and with uh, increased governance and best uh, and better uh, uh, better expectations, we can improve this number. But the greatest effort will need to come from the, the private sector. So we finally arrive at that we need to have an agenda. Not It's an agenda, not just an in, a single initiative to reduce entry barriers I'm sorry for the typo here, but uh, there are some uh, reduce the barriers to, to entry and, and, and attract a greater number of competitors in the infrastructure market, not just public, uh, in the public sector, but in the private sector as well. I would say that the contact that we have and the work that we do show that there are uh, huge challenges that we're, we're facing a, a very limited number of uh, service providers and we need to reduce the barriers to, en to enter the market. And that aligns with a, another huge problem that we face in our economy, which is limited competition, limited uh, innovation. We learned this in the last 50 to 60 years in economics. There's nothing new on the importance of com uh, competition the importance of uh, resource mobility to improve the, the quality of uh, resource allocation and re uh, improve uh, productivity of all the resources and consequently driving our growth with uh, social and inclusion and uh, sustainability. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I apologize if I went over my allotted time, but I'd like to thank you once again. Thank you, Professor Claudio, for your presentation, and I'd like to congratulate you for the material and the, an excellent presentation. I, I found it, the data that you brought incredibly interesting and relevant uh, on the TCU report for uh, in, interrupted construction. That, that's an alarming number, and it's resources that were wasted and they didn't bring any uh, benefits be once the, con the construction is concluded, didn't bring any benefits to society. And these numbers on the, of mega projects uh, for railroad projects that are so uh, overrun in terms of costs and schedule are also part of this guideline that we uh, asked for with a GIZ and they, they they bring these uh, the the data and the experience and the, and we're, they're going to be analyzing the they analyze these issues and also the publication of this meth method for RCF that that you brought which was also excellent so going over all these issues and going through the problems and challenges that we will need to face uh, to overcome these challenges. And since we are already uh, over our time, I'm just going to, um, if you have a final, each of you uh, could uh, make final comments in three minutes. I had several questions for you if we had uh, the time for the questions, but unfortunately we are over our time. So I'd like to ask you if you have any final considerations and uh, approach any of these questions. So just uh, starting with uh, Professor Alexander, uh, if you could uh, make your final remarks in three minutes and if possible, Professor, if you could answer the question, uh, answering three questions. The first is how the, the, is the RCF or other methods can be used to prevent and co combat uh, corruption. That's one of the fronts of this project uh, in partnership with Olosef's and GIZ. 
and what is the importance of focusing on better management of these historical data sets to, for effective transparency of this, this data for society and a government uh, that will be using these, these, these data sets. And lastly, if RCF was used in the power uh, nuclear Hinkley Point C power plant in the UK, in the UK, or if it was used in any other uh, more recent uh, power plant constructions. So, I'd like to hear what you have to say, Professor. Are you there, Professor? Are you have your Do you have your uh, microphone muted? Perhaps uh, he left. So now I'd like then uh, if we'll try to get in touch with him if and let's move on to Secretary Sergio and thanking you for your presentation and going through your and if possible answering in three minutes the question of two questions actually is what could we take from your perception of the international experiences and to improve this part of monitoring of and evaluating public policies in infrastructure? And how could this be used to retrofeed future policies? And uh, I'd like to thank you already for your answer. I think there are several uh, international experiences that are actually incredibly helpful to incorporate and learn from them. I see I saw the presentation of uh, Professor Alexander's pr presentation as an opportunity for us to and to see in the part of the, the development of the project, the design of the project and what are the potential failures and opportunities uh, for improvement that should be emphasized in the uh, design process. So as you have a good evaluation of the project, you can better assess the effectiveness of the policy once it's implemented. And I'd like to conclude just uh, thanking you for the invitation to speak here. And I, I'm going to, I'm not going to use my three minutes since we've gone over to the time already. Thank you so much, Professor and, and Secretary Sergio. So uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Professor Claudio, if in your final uh, remarks, if you could answer a couple of questions. The first of them being, how do you see uh, an external control helping uh, these major mega projects as an example for several uh, the, like uh, data transparency and so on, uh, what you what you think about that, and also what we could take from the ex the international experiences on this subject. Professor Claudio, you have the floor. I know we've uh, gone over time, but as I mentioned in the beginning, the external control, since in the case of uh, the TCU's case, it's essential because uh, in a transition period, I understand that historically TCU w would look uh, at the data ex in an ex post manner. But uh, since we're in a learning curve and a learning period in a transition period, the presence of the TCU f following along the projects and with the continuity of this and looking back in the, during the, the planning phase and needs to be improved and we need to implement filters and this discussion is an incredibly relevant discussion and when you term think in, in terms of execution of public projects or funded by the, the, the government we need to think of reducing hurdles and how can we reduce the hurdles? Just an example, since I mentioned this in my presentation, we have a system nowadays, uh, actually better yet, a practice, a model for tender bids, for highway bids, for concessions, uh, 
where we have a, a bias, a size bias. So it, the way you grant the highways generates a bias for large companies. Even and even these countries, uh, these companies have a, a difficulty because they don't have infinite budgets. So we need to improve this in the sense it looks uh, we, that it's already in the ministry being discussed there, where we need to reduce entry hurdles with a new standard for highway concessions so that we can open this market to dozens actually hundreds of countries companies better yet that could become uh, that could be granted the concession of the highways for larger uh, smaller sections with a different standard of concession as well so here i think in the the tcu plays uh, an essential role key role to promote this dialogue and in tandem something that professor alexander mentioned it constitutes a, a wide database of constructions projects and the, the schedule of constructions and costs and benefits is in, uh, having this data set is key we need to do this we already do this pro bono because but we and we grant th this information but it's very difficult to do it's uh, an insane undertaking but it's it's so important because it would maybe fall under the TCU or a ministry since we are since we have secretary Sergio here to constitute a database and build a database and I think there was an effort in the past but I think we need to widen this and cooperate with the 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 Inter-American De Development Bank or the World Bank, and we have reference database and we need data sets that we don't have. We did current uh, recent project and we did, we kept the data for one project, but we need more. And having an international, in terms of international experience, Professor Alexander gave uh, a brilliant presentation. And I would say that there's a, a learning process in each country, at, at least in my experience, and supporting some countries in my experience, but I think what we lack is a learning experience between countries. And then we could mobilize international uh, institutions that are here, like the, the World Bank and, the, and others to cooperate that you're, in the case that you're bringing like a, a GIZ, to think exactly this and what can we learn from everybody else's experience that would be essential so many countries have already gone through this process that we are going through now and what can they tell us what did they what were the mistakes they made and what did they do right so and i think tcu in a way and they have been already doing it but with the international institutions and multilateral institutions to help us to build a better database and and gather and accrue, accrue from the and know from more uh, experiences that other countries had and then so i'd like to thank you once again for the opportunity and the initiative and for being here and being able to talk and uh, minister anastasia and the the wonderful work that he's been carrying out throughout the years so oh, thank you professor so now moving to the end of our webinar I believe that uh, after everybody's presentations, I, I can see what the main bottlenecks, not just for infrastructure, but going through planning uh, deficiencies, and, and, but uh, an improvement, uh, the need for improve government governance improvement and decision-making processes. Uh, we saw a lot of, uh, of the optimism bias and methods to remove this from the equation several considerations brought by professor by the professors on how to improve uh, legal safety and with better visibility so that other investors and and reducing barriers for more competitiveness and better management of projects so i believe that today's webinar was successful in bringing important reflections 
and definitely a, a step in the right direction and where we see new initiatives to bring better reflections and new tools and new possibilities not all we're not always able to solve everything but at, to at least minimize these hurdles and bottlenecks that we've been experiencing so now just uh, moving on to the uh, to thank thanking everyone i'd like to thank the GIZ cooperation and our partnership with uh, OLOSEFs that made this uh, webinar possible and this guideline, pro the elaboration of this uh, guideline possible and, and also the this webinar. also would like to thank Audio Porto Ferrovia and Bruno Martinelli who's carrying out this this initiative for this project with GIZ and uh, so it's really relevant. And also participation of the coordination of this initiative. Congratulate also our dear Rafael de Mello. He started the project at the time of uh, I think he said science in operation. He was always working on this aspect of visibility and focus. And he used to say that I don't like all initiatives, I like things that end. So that's a possibility to lead a process that we are coming, that we are able to deliver a product uh, and also make this webinar happen. So we are really in the finishing of this project. I'd like to thank Katrina, GIZ, also the minister Antonio Anastasia that was here in the opening of the session, the three experts. I'd like to thank you very much, Professor Sergio, Claudio Verstack, and also I'd like to say that I was told that Professor Alexander Boudier, he had to leave before it was we we're going to close at five and he had another meeting and he had to leave before he was not able to answer your questions but it was a presentation that brought lots of new things and made this event more brilliant i wish you a great afternoon and good evening for everybody so it's the end of today's webinar thank you again